Good evening. Good evening to everyone. I'm Janet Gornick, Professor of Political Science and Sociology and Director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality at the Graduate Center here at the City University of New York. Tonight's program is co-hosted by the Graduate Center Public Programming and the Stone Center, and we're here tonight as part of the series called The Promise and Perils of Democracy, a series that we've had here supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. On behalf of the Graduate Center leadership and public programming and the Stone Center, I'm delighted to open tonight's program. So welcome to our live audience here in Prashansky Auditorium at the Graduate Center and to the 2,000 people who are listening on the live stream. <laughs> Tonight, we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to welcome Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi to our stage to be joined by Professor Paul Krugman. While Speaker Pelosi would be welcomed on stages throughout the United States, we think it's especially apt that she joins us here at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, many of you know this, but for those who don't, the Graduate Center is one of 25 campuses of CUNY, the largest urban university system in the United States. And here at the Graduate Center, which is the principal doctoral granting campus of CUNY, we're committed to the idea that knowledge is a public good. And we're exercising that this evening, uh, of course, through our public programming, exercising our commitment to our home community of New York City uh, and beyond. And, and part of that, of course, is our public programming and tonight's uh, special event. Many of the issues that the speaker has worked on for decades are deeply entwined with the work that our faculty, staff, and students carry out here at the Graduate Center. Members of our diverse academic community engage in policy-relevant research and teaching focused on, among many vital concerns, globalization, environmental protection, urban education, the security and vibrancy of immigrant communities, and in the case of the Stone Center, socioeconomic inequality and intergenerational mobility. Speaker Pelosi hardly needs an introduction, nevertheless. She has represented San Francisco in the House of Representatives for more than 35 years. In 2007, she was elected as the 52nd Speaker of the House of Representatives, the first woman to hold that position. She was the chief architect of the enormously consequential Affordable Care Act. And also the American Rescue Plan. She's long championed policies that secure the economic well-being of American families, and she's led on crucial policy initiatives aimed at environmental protection, gun violence prevention, marriage equality, immigration reform, and many others. In her last term, she oversaw the creation of the historic House Select Committee on the January 6th attack. Speaker Pelosi is widely regarded as the most influential speaker in U.S. history. <laughs> when her run as speaker ended earlier this year, even members of the other party acknowledged her historic run, <laughs> if not too many in the current House. Nevertheless, her two Republican predecessors said of her respectively that she left an impressive legacy and that no other Speaker of the House in the modern era, Republican or Democrat, has wielded the gavel with such authority or with such consistent results. Tonight, she's joined by Professor Paul Krugman, who's well known to many of us here at the Graduate Center. He's a Nobel Prize winning economist, a columnist for the New York Times, and author of many best-selling books. including most recently, Arguing with Zombies, Economics, Politics, and the Fight for a Better Future. He now serves as Distinguished Professor of Economics here at the Graduate Center and as a Senior Scholar in the Stone Center. So before I step off, let me just mention one bit of logistics. Those of you here in the live audience uh, have been handed index cards, and those are there for you to write some questions on them. Uh, people will come down the aisles to collect those index cards at about 10 past 7, and then they'll be passed um, on to the stage. So let me ask you all, uh, having uh, sorted many of these index cards, let me ask you all to do your best to use block print because 
<laughs> Usually we get a pile of index cards that we can't read. So um, the end of, the end of uh, handwriting in America, I'm afraid. So please do uh, print carefully so that Professor Krugman can read them. Uh, so those are our instructions. Speaker Pelosi, welcome to the City University of New York. Welcome to the Graduate Center. And Paul, I turn the evening over to you. Thanks, Janet, and thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It's an uh, incredible honor to be interviewing you. This is the second time I've done this, uh, and a few things have happened since then. Uh, um, and uh, we, I, I want to talk about uh, a fair number of current events, but also some past ones. And um, um, I noticed uh, Janet mentioned you know, just a couple of the, of the in incredible uh, historic pieces of legislation that were passed under your leadership. Um, but it's only a couple, and there are, there, are, there are a bunch. And one of the ones that, if you had asked me a few weeks ago, I would have, would have listed uh, financial reform as being among the really big achievements, that, uh, you know, that the Dodd-Frank legislation was, everyone agreed, imperfect, a little bit kludgy, but we thought it was doing a pretty good job of financial stability, and then we, a few things happened in the last few weeks so all of a sudden. Um, do you have, do you think um, that, what, what do you think needs to be done? What, what were the, or do you think that this revealed some, some fundamental flaws that we didn't fix, and, and what would you be doing to, uh, to avoid things like the bank runs that we've been seeing in the last few weeks? Thank you very much, Paul, for your leadership. What an honor it is to be here with you. Perhaps tonight you'll tell us what it feels like to be a, receiver, a recipient of the Nobel Prize. <laughs> That's a big thing. That, that, that plus five dollars will get you a latte. No. Uh, That's good. And uh, Janet, thank you for your kind words. I accept every compliment on behalf of the House Democrats who had the courage to vote for all of that. And um, I thank you for your welcome to, to the University of New York. It really is an honor to be here in the graduate program. So uh, let me just say, to put it in context, that for some of you who may not remember, it's hard to forget, but not, we had a big challenge in September, September, I'm going to tell them the whole story. Sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> because you may have heard about this, but I want you to hear the full story. September 8th is September 2008, like the 12th day of the month or something like that. And all of a sudden, we're seeing this cascade of events. Burl Stearns had been earlier, but it was Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, and boom, that day, AIG where the Fed bailed them out for tens of billions of dollars, which we didn't even know the Fed had or had the authority to do, but nonetheless. So I called the Secretary of the Treasury, and I said to him, see, usually a speaker gets briefed by the Secretary of the Treasury regularly on markets, whether it's credit markets, global markets, well, not the stock market, you have it on your phone, but nonetheless, the impact of one thing and another. But I hadn't heard from him in a couple of weeks when all this was going on, so I called him. I looked at my watch, it was three o'clock in the afternoon because I said, you usually brief me, but I have my leadership here. I want you to brief everyone of our leadership so that we don't say anything that could undermine the confidence in the markets because this is, looks pretty drastic. We didn't know how drastic. So I said, I'd like you to come tomorrow morning at nine o'clock to the Capitol to brief not just me, but the Democratic leadership. To which the Secretary of the Treasury said, Madam Speaker, we call each other Hank and Nancy, but when he said that, I said, Madam Speaker, tomorrow morning will be too late. Then why am I calling you? <laughs> why aren't you? Is this more than you want to know on the subject? No, uh, uh, this is what we... <laughs> well, you know, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> So we planned to have a meeting later that evening, five o'clock, I said, I'll call ben, Chairman Bernanke and we'll meet at five o'clock with the leadership. This day. The White House finds out about the meeting and they are concerned because I said, when I said, why are you, am I calling you? They said, well, the White House really didn't want Congress to know about this just yet, kind of thing. 
So, um, so when they found out about the meeting of the White House, and I have the deepest respect, despite Iraq, for George W. Bush, but nonetheless, the White House, whoever that is, said, who said she could have a meeting? And t say, you tell them back, the Speaker of the House says she's having a meeting at 5 o'clock, and they can come <laughs> if they want or not. But anyway, we make it 7, so we have Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, and the committees of jurisdiction. That's, that was the banking committee and ways and means like that. Okay, so we go have the meeting. Paul's heard me tell this story. So we have the meeting. It's like 7 o'clock, 7.30 it starts. Bipartisan, bicameral. Hank, Mr. Secretary, describes a scenario. Am I exaggerating, Paul? From hell. The depths of hell. <laughs> The depths of hell, so deep that not Dante would never have even thought to name something <laughs> that far down. So in any event, I say to the chairman of the Fed, Mr. Chairman, what do you have to say about what the secretary said about the condition of our financial institutions? To which he said, if we do not act immediately, we may not have an economy by Monday. No commercial paper. Nothing. Well, that's really a kick in the head by a mule. That is as bad as it comes. We will not have an economy by Monday from the chairman of the Fed. So um, clearly we had to do something, and it, time was of the essence, and it was urgent, and it would have to be bipartisan and the rest. So the chairman starts to, uh, excuse me, the secretary of treasury starts to outline a plan we have a plan. We've been planning this. It's called the Break the Glass Plan, an emergency. Break the Glass Plan. And um, I said, well, why haven't you used it so far? <laughs> <laughs> and they said this. We were saving it for the next president, which was kind of sad, because if we had that urgency, there's two more months until the next election eight weeks, something like that. And what we read into that is we know Barack Obama was going to be elected. The market will crash the next day because it's imminent. The, the market, the financial right. services industry will crash. And then, and my understanding of their plan was that they were going to break the glass and buy the toxic assets of these financial institutions. I've never heard an oxymoron, more oxymoronic than <laughs> toxic assets. <laughs> and nonetheless, um, the evening went on. Harry Reid would say, um, tell me when it's more than you want to know. Harry Reid, his moment may come sooner than yours. <laughs> Paul's, Harry Reid would say, how much is this going to cost? A hundred billion dollars? No, 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 no. Then we proceed with all the, the discussion. Fifteen minutes later, two hundred billion dollars. Three, three. When it got to four hundred billion, the secretary said, oh, "Mr. Leader, you're getting warmer." <laughs> uh, to which I said, "That's how I speak to my grandchildren, but that's not how we speak to the leader of the Senate. How much is it going to cost?" Well. We'll let you know in a couple of hours. We would later learn in a couple of days. $700 billion. Now, you should know that at that time, our entire domestic, non-defense domestic budget, not including like Social Security, et cetera, but the discretionary domestic budget was $350 billion. So this is like two years of everything we spend on everything other than defense, and um, I don't call them entitlements, but our insurance programs. I, I'm cutting it short, believe it or not. <laughs> okay, so we go out, we go in the press conference, we're going to have so many time is of the essence, we have to have it, and President Bush was, he understood that something needed to be done. And he said that he would get the Republicans. I was going to get 110 Democrats, 120 Democrats, because we had more. 
he would get 100 Republicans and we would pass this agreed upon plan. The, uh, we made some changes in it. For example, if the whole 700 wasn't spent, it did not turn into a slush fund for the Secretary of Treasury. That was kind of one of their things, which that was never gonna happen. But the, in other, anyway, the, the time comes and I said to the President, oh, this is just the mechanics of the house. I don't bring a bill to the floor unless I have names. I have much more than my 120. I need to see your 100 names. Well, who would vote against this? The White House says, who would vote against this? Well, I don't know, but I need to know who's voting for it. <laughs> <laughs> so in any event, what happened was they went to the floor and said, we don't, if essentially, laissez, 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 laissez faire. They made, made um, uh, Adam Smith look small compared to their laissez faire. We don't believe in supervision. We don't believe in regulation. And the walls come, keep coming down. We don't believe in intervention. And they voted against it, and that was that. It wasn't until we brought up the bill again later with more Democratic votes and more Republican votes, but never to the hundredth. For, the, for those in the audience who may not remember, this, this was the TARP, which was failed on the first vote. And then the market went the markets went to hell, and only after the markets had gone to hell. Sorry, I, I shouldn't say that given what just happened. Um, the, uh, um, so in any then event, it came back, got passed. But, but to that point, and, and there's a lot more. Read my book. I'm going to write a book about this because I'm reading other people's books and I think that's like this piece of the story. It's not the whole thing. You know more now than they have in their books. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the thing is, is that after TARP, we passed Dodd-Frank. And Dodd-Frank was predicated, uh, premised on the, what we saw that was needed that had created this situation in the first place. And one of the things we had in Dodd-Frank was higher standards that the banks had to meet. And when a new administration came in later under the previous occupant of, occasionally of the White House, they, um, um, they took down parts of Dodd-Frank. If they had been in place, there would be a good chance that that could have prevented if the bank had honored the original Dodd-Frank. You never know, but it, the good chance that it could have. But they, it was a movement to uh, unleash some of those um, um, assurances, and I think we have to put those back. And this bank that went down lobbied heavily to get rid of those um, uh, of those preventions. Yeah, again, for the audience, that some of the restrictions uh, were loosened for smaller banks. So the, the, the really big banks, I think, are still pretty much have the, the full Dodd-Frank plan of plea. But uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which was a, I always feel like I'm a character from, from uh, uh, Austin Powers, uh, one million, you know, so Silicon Valley Bank was a smallish bank with only 300 billion in assets. Billion dollars. Um, and, uh, and was exempt from some of the re regulations thanks to this uh, change in the- Change, so I think we have to, look at putting that back, uh, but just to do it in a way that there is an argument for some small banks to be able to have access to more opportunities, but it isn't at the expense of, of, um, of enabling some of these other banks to run free. So the, um, I don't want to spend too much on this, but the, the, what do you think the- We already have. The, uh, yeah, we probably have, <laughs> all right. Just, I, I, I was just struck by, um, at just how fast the response was this time. Uh, that they, you know, the, the bank run began on a Thursday and the FDIC had seized the bank by Friday morning. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that, it, I guess that just, you think that that sort of thing didn't happen in 2008 because there were so many people who were just opposed to the idea of the government uh, intervening? Well, the, we ac actually, we could have had the legislation passed sooner except the Republicans weren't there for the vote. Now the reason it was necessary to have it be bipartisan, because here this was the president's, it was the president's problem. They came to us with it and wanted a solution. We were willing to go along with what they were suggesting. And again, in a better form. But they weren't there for the vote. 
I really do believe, just to talk politics for a moment, that one of the reasons we lost in 2010 was not about Cl uh, Portable Care Act. It was about the fact that we were identified as the ones who bailed out the Wall Street, not Main Street. That's not what we did. We bailed out the economy, but people saw it that way. And it created, what do they call themselves on the left, on the right? Well, the Tea the, Party. The Tea Party and Main Street, uh, Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street on the other side, this big difference springing from the same thing that Wall Street should not have been bailed out. Let's, let's talk about um, crisis future, um, but, it, it, but with, with echoes of the past. Uh, so we're a few months away from hitting the if debt ceiling. I just ceiling. may, on that score, because you talked about timing, yes, the, the, the FDIC was in there Friday, but we needed to have a solution before the markets opened in Asia on Sunday night. And that's why it, everything was moving quickly. And we spent $700 billion in 2008, what, $20 billion this time, yeah, this to time stop the systemic risk and the... Um, uh, but might have become if, if they hadn't moved quickly, if, if, if the current right. leadership. Um, um, yeah, I, we, could, I, we could spend the whole time on this, but let's, let's talk about the debt ceiling, because uh, we are... Just, you know, they're the uh, friends of the debt ceiling in here want to speak up. <laughs> Do <right>. so now. <laughs> um, so, you were uh, you were there for the uh, um, obviously not uh, during the period when you weren't speaker because otherwise there wouldn't have been a problem. But there uh, for a couple of confrontations over the debt ceiling, um, uh, and now we appear to be just a few months uh, from yeah. hitting this this crazy limit, um, you, what can you tell us about how it was resolved in the previous occasions and, and whether you think uh, those okay. lessons are useful now? Okay, so for 20 years, I have been speaker or leader. 20 years, the top Democrat one way or another. That means I have been involved. That's not, I don't say it as an applause, it's just to say I have been involved in 19 engagements of the debt limit kind, okay? 19 times we've had to deal with it one way or another. And uh, the fact is, just so you know, and most of you do, the debt limit is about bills incurred. It's not about how we go forward. It's about what we need to pay as to what has been uh, and um, engaged, what, what we have uh, bought, now we have to pay for it. So um, the question becomes, do, do you, how do you, they want to tie it to the budget, they want it to, to put constraints on it. So here's where we are now, and because we've had some terrible fights in the past over this, and some of it timed so that it was occurred around the time of shutting down government. In 2011, which is a very famous time, President Obama was president. We were in the minority, but we were at the table for what we would be able to do. And just the discussion that we might, that, that the Republicans might not vote to lift the debt ceiling lowered our credit rating. You remember that. Yeah. It lowered our credit rating, just the discussion. Correct? Yeah. And that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing for you at your kitchen table. It's not a good thing for our country. It's not a good thing globally. It went on for a while. Um, I, don't, I have a tendency to tell the story. It might be too much. But in any event, it, we end up with a shutdown of government. And this one, at least, is now. It's now. The, the shutdown of government is fraught with meaning September 30th, yeah. or if it's put off. But before then, we still have, uh, we can still function on the basis of last year's um, appropriation. So here's what it is. Right now, in May, the administration will, will see what the um, income is right. in April. We'll see what, how much money comes in. Depending on what that is, then the administration will say, uh, we'll, 
we ha can use extraordinary means. Can they have been doing that already. They're doing it already, but th that we may be able to survive a couple of more months. But if they go too close to September, that gives extra leverage to the other side who does not want to lift the debt ceiling and does not want to um, have a budget that meets the needs of the American people. So, so what do they have? They hear their options. They have, they have one where they say, we should have debt ceiling without any discussion of the budget. However, in the debt ceiling, we want to have the, the uh, demand that the budget be the budget of 2019, yeah. which means that we cut out about 25% of our domestic discretionary non-defense budget. Yeah. That's harmful if you have a Pell Grant, if you're Head Start, if you're food stamps, well, not food stamps, but many other initiatives. Uh, and just the business of governance, just the business of the governance. The thing is, I, at least uh, tell me if I'm reading this wrong. In 2011, um, President Obama did, in effect, allow himself to be blackmailed a little bit uh, into some discretionary spending cuts over the debt ceiling, which many of us thought was horrible. Uh, but uh, but at, at least um, there was a, it was kind of clear who to talk to on the Republican side. It was kind of clear what the Republicans wanted. And I, as I read it right now, it's not even clear that there is any kind of coherent demand. It's not even clear that your successor as speaker is capable of, of, of getting a vote through. Uh, is, that, is that a correct reading? Does he have any friends in the audience who would like to speak out? Uh, okay, uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing, because when you're doing this, it's really important to know what you're talking about. And that is, that comes with some experience and also respect for what the budget is. We believe that the budget should be a statement of our national values. What is important to us as a country should be what that budget looks like. And it's about our children, our investment in them. The, um, the veterans come under domestic. That isn't a security, that's right. under domestic. So, so many things that people depend on come under the domestic discretionary budget. So what happened in 2011, and I see by the paper, not that he told me, but I see by your local Metropolitan Journal here that, um, that um, President Biden has said he's not going down that same route right. as President Obama did then. But it was very hard because we were backing into the September 30th date. And exactly what happened then, it became in how do we also keep government open as part of the discussion, Yeah, which we didn't which we didn't, they shut down. That, so it, it, because they kept cutting, they kept cutting it, the budget down, cutting it down, cutting it down to such a low point that we even said, okay, well, that's better than shutting government down. We'll take your low number. And then they said, we can't even get the votes for our low number. Yeah. I mean, that, it was a terrible time, but it, it, um, it did result in lower budget numbers. Yeah, it, it, but at this time it's not even clear that there's anything that would Okay, so here are the things they want to do. They either want to go back to 2019 or 17 or any time that cuts across the board discretionary domestic non-defense. Remember all those Ds, because that's that pack. It's not defense. And by the way, many things that are defense fall under d domestic. For example, the, the veteran's budget, and we owe our veterans everything. We respect them, we love them, we want them to have what they need, but we can't be cutting discretionary d domestic. Okay, so they've said three things. We'll either go to 21, which would be a severe cut in domestic, or 19, which would be worse as part of their debt ceiling lifting. Or the third thing, again, this must be more than you ever want to know, but the third thing is they want to have a commitment to balance the budget in 10 years. If you do that, you balance the budget in 10 years, and you say, we're not taking a dime out of what we're doing for defense, and they're now saying, and we're not gonna touch Social Security and Medicare, 
it would result in an 85% cut in domestic discretionary yeah, no, defense it's spending. I mean, it's impossible. You can't, you can't run a government, but they don't believe in governance. They don't believe in governance. They don't believe in science. So it's really hard to, con to convince them of something because, say, for example, if science says we should do this to protect our planet and, and government said this is what was necessary uh, for uh, energy, et cetera, they don't, uh, two no's do not make a yes for them on this. So it's, ver it's, it's very hard. And that's why the public engagement on it is so very, very important. When we go to the table about the budget, I, as leader or speaker, I would say to our representatives, put this in the middle of the table, gross. And when anything they bring up, does it create jobs and does it reduce the national debt? You can do both. But they just haven't seemed to want to go there. So They'll say, oh, we want to cover any expenses if we increase Pell Grants or something has to be paid for. Okay. But if we give 83% of a tax bill that gives 83% of the benefits to the top 1% in our country, we don't have to pay for that. And that costs $2 trillion. So um, can I ask just... That the, can be an applause line. <laughs> right, it could be. Um, I won't press this too much, but uh, suppose we approach D-Day, debt ceiling day, and, and there's, there's just nothing that's... Suppose we approach that, that limit and, uh, you know, what a lot of us are, in my line, are terrified of, about is financial consequences. U.S. Treasury bills are, you know, are, are the safe assets in the world, and if our full faith and credit is called into question, God knows. Um, the, do, you, do you think, I mean, it, it appears from where I'm sitting that the Biden administration's plan is to basically to reach the point where the fear of God comes, gets into the republic as they realize um, brinksmanship, basically. Um, but do you think that will work? And if not, do you have any, I, we can get way too deep into the weeds here, but there are various possible legal end runs around the debt ceiling. Do you have any view on any of that? Well, one of the important ones, one of them is proposed by Mitch McConnell and in the House by Brendan Boyle, who's the chairman, well, would be the chairman of the banking, excuse me, the budget, budget committee in the House. Brendan Boyle's a member from, uh, from Pennsylvania. He's the chair, he's the ranking, the top Democrat on the budget committee. For a long time now, he has had a bill similar to what Mitch has in the Senate. And what that would say is, let's follow the Constitution. The Constitution says the full faith and credit of the United States of America should not, is not in doubt. It is not in doubt. In the past, we had something called the, uh, the Gephardt Amendment, and that when the budget passed, the, uh, that amendment said the debt ceiling was lifted. So you didn't hear about that years gone by. Now, that's gone, and so, um, so what the, the McConnell and the Senate Boyle and the House bill would do is to say, this is a responsibility of the executive branch. The president, in the case of Mitch, it says the president. In the case of Brendan, it says the president or the secretary of the treasury. The executive branch shall lift the debt ceiling. If Congress disagrees, they have 30 days to overturn that. And that would take so care that's, of that. So that's the constitutional option, the 14th Amendment. You just sort of say, well, it's not, yeah, yeah, we're going to say that the debt ceiling, it, well, we, we, we feel that, that the Constitution gives us the right to disregard right. it. But it doesn't require a constitutional amendment. No, no, it's, it's just existing. Just a simple, simple majority. Okay, but, the, but so we have to see, well, I don't know in the Senate if it would be a simple majority, but that's up to the Senate. But, the, but, the, uh, but it's short of that, the, the business community has to weigh in. I mean, really? They for. weigh in when they want their tax cuts. They weigh in when they don't want regulation. They have to weigh in to lift the debt ceiling. They have to weigh in that. And because it has global consequences. It's, it's, as I said, these people don't even know what they're talking about when they think that that's cute, as we say in Texas. Cute. It ain't cute. It's yeah. very dangerous. And so we'll see. But, but um, a lot, I mean, if God... Suppose we get a lot of revenue coming in in April. 
and that pushes the urgency down the road closer to September, that would be unfortunate. I mean, it's not unfortunate to get more money in, but would hope that it would um, not push us closer to a shutdown of government. Yeah. I'm sorry, that it's off topic, I can't resist it. it. You'll be seeing it in the paper tomorrow, but the uh, um, Medicare, Medicare's budget is looking better, and the reason it's looking better is that COVID killed off a lot of the sickest Medicare recipients. Um, it's, it's amazing what, the, what can happen. Um, um, but if wow. we had Im comprehensive immigration reform and we had many more people paying into Social Security and Medicare, uh, that would help. So I've been remiss. Um, I'm supposed to be, have reminded you five minutes ago to, if you have questions to fill out index cards and, and be prepared to pass them over because that's how we're going to be getting questions. We will be, in about 17 minutes, we'll be uh, dealing with questions from the audience, which means that I have about 30 seconds for each of my remaining questions. Uh, <laughs> which means he's telling me to be brief in my answers. No, no we won't do that. I, I, mean, I, I actually, this is a, a question uh, maybe you can answer for me. I, it's, it's a curious, it's not a current policy issue, but one of the things that, so I, I look at, at how we, the policy response to COVID and how we dealt with the fiscal response to COVID and just found it was astonishingly good that we actually insulated the American people from a lot of the hardship, that you, financial hardship that you might have expected given that the temporarily 30 million people were thrown out of work. And the CARES Act, which was enacted under former guy, um, but um, was an amazingly progressive piece of legislation. How did that happen? Well, that happened because the bill that we passed didn't look at any of the bill that they presented. You understand? No, sorry. <laughs> I, no, I, I, I didn't quite get that. Okay. What they initially proposed would not have fit the description you just, descri you just presented. But we had, we want to pass this. These are certain things we have to have there. And so the, we had a negotiation. Now, it wasn't, it was good, but we still had a lot more work because we could never really convince them that diversity, about the diversity in our country. And that if we're going to fight an affliction like COVID or anyone else, we needed to know who and how it affected different communities. And that meant we had to go have outreach and figure that out. In the Hispanic community, in the African American community, Asian Pacific community, and in, in every community to find out what it was. They said to me, do you know how much that costs to do? And I said, do you know how much it costs to pass a bill? Uh, you know, we really have to do this. We really did a little bit of it in that bill, but we had to fight more. Even with the PPP, the assistance to small businesses and the rest, we had to pass another bill that really addressed small businesses, women-owned, veterans-owned, uh, uh, um, all, all diversity-owned businesses, because it was going to the high. It was going to the high end. It was just unfair. Okay, so what you're saying is that there were Republican proposals, because I never heard about them, but they were just so far inadequate and that, that the Democrats basically had something that, that seemed to... Well, we had to have a compromise. Yeah. We had to have a compromise, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, all right, uh, just um, big bills. Um, American Rescue Plan. Yeah. So that's the, that's the one that, that is really deeply controversial. It's the big spending bill passed at the beginning of the current administration. Um, it's, uh, it, there, it, it has uh, a lot of, even, even some uh, you know, moderately, uh, f fairly moderate uh, economists think that it was too big, that it was, uh, has fed inflation. How do you feel about uh, uh, given the history, given what's happened since about the American Rescue Plan, are there things that you would have done differently in that, in that bill? Well, uh, I respect the bill for its title, the American Rescue Plan, yeah. and that's exactly what it did. It rescued, it had many things in it that we couldn't get under the previous administration. This was the first initiative under President Biden to address it. 
we couldn't get assistance for state and local and county governments to do their jobs, the business of living, whether it was police, fire, teachers, transportation, you name it, any of those elements needed to be funded so that our economy and our society could function. They were opposed to it because many of those businesses, many of those in, um, initiatives are union, are minority, are women that are engaged in those services. So there was no way we were gonna get that under the previous administration. Okay, okay. remember what I said before. Does it promote growth? And what does it do about the debt? We think that the rescue plan was a rescue that was worth what it did to create jobs, to keep people in their jobs, and to help create revenue to come back into the treasury. Okay, I mean, so, but it was, I mean, the, just, I, I don't wanna go for very far on this, but just devil's advocate, it was, a, Two trillion dollar injection into an economy that was already recovering, and and at least there's some co concern that it did uh, feed inflation at the time. Well, it was less than that, but it was one of the things that we have as a um, sort of a barometer for what we do is does it have justice? Yeah. Now we want the full economy to recover in all of its beautiful diversity, and again. Uh, in a way that really helped the kitchen table needs of America's working families. I don't even know, and this may be her 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 heretical to you, I don't even know if GDP is the accurate reflection of the health of our economy. It's an indicator, but what does that mean to the kitchen table of America's working families? We think that this bill was a match for that. And it was less than that, but it was what was what was really needed. It had a child tax credit, which cut child poverty in half. We think that was yeah. worth it. That is something that we will continue and continue to fight for because now it has expired. The Biden child tax credit. It had initiatives that relate to uh, home health care, child care, all the rest, things that are about women in the workplace, families in the work, dads in the workplace. Uh, and so it was um, transformative. It wasn't incremental as what we've done before or how we measure success. It was about how we transform our society. And it was unfortunate that we could not, again, get it renewed when we tried to after that, uh, the, the time frame of it expired. But it, it, I wish I had a chart here to show you piece by piece by piece what was in there. We tried then when we had the BBB that version to put all of that back in, but we couldn't get that done. We couldn't get that done. Instead, the most that we could get of that was something else called the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which had the biggest, biggest infusion of resources to saving the planet ever for any country in the world, including our own. And to, and to do it, and would you do it with justice, environmental justice, economic justice, and how we engage, engage people to be participating in new green technologies as we go forward. We had the CHIPS Act, we had all these other things uh, along the way too that are in furtherance of justice. The infrastructure bill, $60 billion for justice in terms of how we build infrastructure in our country. So some of these things may appear to be more expensive dollar-wise to people but value-wise, they were a very major ingest, investment for our country. So that's how we see it. Yeah, I, Inflation Reduction Act, by the way, that was, that was kind of like a last-minute miracle, right? We, I, I, like many people, had kind of given up, saying it's just not gonna happen, uh, and then it did. Can you tell us anything about, you know, how did that, because it, it, it is, it's, it was, I mean, the environmental, um, experts I know are, are over the moon over, over yeah. what was accomplished in that. Do, 
can you tell us anything about you know how how was that? Well, the inflation in the BBB. Just to get back to that, we had three pieces. We had the um, what is in the IRA, a large piece for the uh, in, in climate to address the climate crisis. It is a health issue, the air our children breathe, the water they drink, etc. And grandchildren, my grandchildren, Thomas, is, grandchild Thomas is here. It's an, a health issue, it's a jobs issue, it's a security issue, because we've got we've to address the climate crisis, if for no other reason but uh, the, um, the effects of drought and, and all the other things that you know come with the uh, climate, uh, climate crisis. They are sources of conflict for competition for, for um, resources and habitat and the rest. So it was an, and it's a values issue. If you believe as I do that this is God's creation, we have a moral responsibility to be good stewards. But even if you don't share that religious view, we all have a value that we know we have a responsibility to future generations, current generations of young people to pass this planet on. So for us, that was a big values piece. Expensive, $368 billion, but values-based. Then it had two other pieces, and one of them related to healthcare directly and the expansion of Medicaid and things like that. And then a third piece, which was home health care. We still haven't accomplished that, which is child tax credit extended, child care more affordable, home health care, even if it's not child care, but uh, older people, siblings, and the rest, or even a child who needs health care from work, and, which we added in the House, family and medical leave paid. Paid. <laughs> that, the traffic would not bear that. We have to live to fight another day. But we got that, the one piece. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stay with the IRA for, by the way, one thing that, the one thing that really was disappointing was uh, the naming of the bills. Build Back Better was actually about building back better. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, whatever it was about, was not about reducing inflation. But uh, uh, Buzz, it had uh, uh, money, it raised money to pay for these things and raised more money as a debt reduction. Well, but that's kind of gets to what I, I and I don't know whether you're hearing the same thing I'm hearing, but I'm hearing from people. The, the, the IRA doesn't, it, a lot of it is not specified outlays. A lot of it is tax credits for green energy transition. And the projected expenditure depends upon how many businesses take up those tax credits. And the word um, that I'm hearing is that the business response has been far more enthusiastic than expected, which is great in terms of saving the planet, but also means that the outlays are probably going to be substantially larger. Do you have, have you heard that? We have a limit. There's a, a limit on it. If, it. if we didn't have a limit, we could have had some of these other initiatives. Right. We couldn't but go past a certain number. But I'm, I'm still hearing that the climate stuff may well be a couple of hundred billion dollars, maybe even as much as $400 billion more than the CBO estimate. Uh, I don't know if you, is that all wrong? And, and, and if, to the extent that, that it does happen, do you, do you worry about it? Well, we may have to address, I mean, if in fact it meets the standard of, remember, all of this creates jobs. Yeah. And, and so we have to see uh, income from it too, because we're not, it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. And so it isn't as if we're just putting out money and nothing is happening. If it's job creating and revenue creating and that, then there's a, an evaluation as to what our responsibility is. But it would be very hard to go past the number that we have. Okay. That's, uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. I just, uh, it's, and it's also, by the way, stimulating a lot of private investment along with, yes, nice. which uh, if you're worried about an overheated economy is a bit of a concern, but on the other hand, uh, a little bit of economic overheating versus uh, an uninhabitable planet. Uh, is Don't kind worry, of the, if the Republicans have anything to do with it, they'll hurt us on the debt ceiling and that will cause a recession. That's true. <laughs> That's a good way. Um, we have to watch our fights. You know, that's what we have to do. I don't know if there's, I think actually, 
if I get into any of the further questions, we're going to lose too much time. So I've, I think actually if maybe we get some of the questions from the audience and, and, uh, and move into that phase. Um, this has been, I mean, uh, there's so much I'd like to ask about, but do, do we have uh, our index cards coming? Are we, five minutes? All right, so let me ask you, uh, all right, Janet. let me give you the sort of uh, completely open-ended uh, state of the parties, state of democracy. And we, we could actually spend three hours on that, but do you have anything you'd like to say about where we are? Because this is, this is a, you know, the Tea Party looks like a bunch of extremely uh, easy to deal with uh, polite people compared with what we're dealing with now. What, what, yeah. Any views on where we are? Let's say that our democracy, let, we always use the standard of this. Our founders had the vision to create a great country, the greatest country that ever has existed in the history of the world, a country predicated on the belief that we're all created equal, not necessarily reflected in our opening document, in the Declaration, yes, but not in the Constitution, but the Constitution allowed for amendment. So for the history of our country, we have always had an expansion of freedom in America, whether it was the abolition of slavery, whether it was having right to vote for all men anyway, and then women having the right to vote, and then uh, issues that related to marriage equality and that we're always expanding freedom until the Dobbs decision, which was an assault on freedom in our country families' freedom to make their own choices and the rest. But the first time that the Supreme Court had narrowed freedom and did so against its own precedent, even though those judges said that they would support the precedent of the Supreme Court. So that, there, that we had that. That was a terrible message to the rest of the world, to women in the rest of the world, too, because it was like, America is telling families what to do about their family planning. So yes, that is a weakening. But as Joe Biden says, never underestimate the strength of America's institutions. This is a great country. So we honor the vision of our founders, the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform who fought for freedom, not just it's about democracy, but it's about freedom and the aspirations of our children. So this is a fight that we must make in our own country. At the same time, in Ukraine, there is a fight going on in this global fight of democracy versus autocracy, freedom versus those constraints. And so the, the fight in Ukraine is our fight, their fight and our fight. And, And there are, uh, shall we say, a little bit of a Putin task force or something, even in the Congress, that's like, oh, you know, and th that's just plain wrong, and that's what we have to fight. I don't know if you saw Thomas Friedman's uh, column some time ago, when there was an article, and, and that he quoted someone who said, the newcomers to our country value the democracy so much. And they say it seems like Americans treat democracy like a football that they can kick around. But you should treat it more like a Fabergé egg. It's fragile. You have to be careful with the democracy. And you have to always, always strengthen it. That's why LGBTQ rights, all the rest of that, are expansion of our freedom. And anybody who fights for a woman's right to choose or LGBTQ f uh, freedom, uh, 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 respect and all the rest of that, they're patriots. They're fighting to keep our democracy ever expanding in our country. But it is something, and I'll quote Lincoln, a, a Republican president who said, I'm, I'm quoting a Republican, I want you. <laughs> he said, public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything. Without it, practically nothing. But for public sentiment to prevail, people have to know they have to get the message of what is at stake. And I do believe that despite the differences between the parties, and I keep saying to the Republicans, take back your party. This isn't who you are. You're a great party. We need you to return to that greatness instead of that cultness. But nonetheless, the, um, 
if people know what is at stake and what it means to them, their freedom, their freedom of choice and opportunity and fairness in our economy and our economic and environmental systems and the rest, then people will more, take more responsibility uh, for our democracy. But we have to fight it in our own country. We have to fight it where it is assaulted in the rest of the world because that is the American way. That's what we have done in two world wars for which, I mean, the world would be a different place without freedom-loving Americans. Okay. You kind of just answered the first question from the audience, but maybe expand a bit. It was, uh, given the increasingly aggressive autocratic forces uh, gaining traction in the world, what do, you, what do you envision and hope for in democracy in, in the future? And you've already made clear about uh, what, uh, your views on Ukraine, which I share, by the way. Uh, but uh, anything else that we ought to be looking towards, you know, sort of, uh, at home, but, but abroad, what, what can America be doing? Well, a couple things at home. I really do think, and I don't, I say this all the time, and I've said it for years, if we really want people to participate in a democracy, in elections, in a way that is um, universal, is, is expected, not having to urge, but to, to uh, appeal to, and that is, we have to reduce the role of big, dark money in politics. We absolutely have to do that. And we have a bill to do that. It's been sitting in the Senate for, well, well we passed it in the House again and again. John Lewis wrote the first 300 pages of it. And we have to do other things like the Voting Rights Act and things like that so that people know that their vote counts, that they are important. And we have to honor the voices of small donors in the process so they know that their participation and their voice makes a difference. So we have to, shall we say, enhance the perception of democracy by really making a difference in whose voices matter in our country. And globally, this is, this is something that doesn't happen in the rest. I mean, when I travel, when I speak it, Cambridge or Oxford or London School of Economics or wherever it happens to be in the UK where you recently spoke, did you? Uh, they say to me, these kids say, young people say to me, what are you doing about money in politics in America? So that's one of the challenges we have. Do you think it would be so hard to save the planet if there wasn't big, dark fossil fuel money in the mix? Do you think it would be so hard to lower the cost of prescription drugs? Do you think it would be so hard to have gun violence prevention in our country if it weren't for big, dark money there? Young people see this. They see this as a threshold. This is a threshold. And the enhancing the voices of people enhances the strength of democracy. And we have to be the model to the rest of the world that we are. And in terms of fighting in other places, I think Joe Biden deserves an enormous amount of credit for the manner in which he has built a coalition in fighting with and helping the Ukrainians <laughs> fight for democracy, democracy and freedom there. And I could say more about that if you want, but I know you have a handful of questions. Well, okay. I, um, let me take one that's kind of off that, and then that may, we may well come back to, to that in, in our few minutes remaining. Um, there was a question about immigration reform. Uh, which is something that we keep on saying we need to to you know fix this. Would you have any any views on on what is actually should be done that and and actually can be done? Well, I as I said earlier, if we had comprehensive immigration reform, it would be helpful to our budget. It would be very helpful to our budget in terms of Social Security, Medicare, and all of that. But also just in having people pay into the system in a not an underground way, but in a way that, that uh, helps them and helps us. But the, uh, we've been fighting for a long time to help the dreamers. This is, this is like a gift to us. These young people have come to this country as small children, not knowing any other land, and some of them not even knowing any other language. Uh, the courage of their parents to bring them here. And 
we fought so hard. In fact, I spoke on the floor for eight over eight hours for the Dreamers. I didn't go to do that, but as I was there, people kept handing me letters and stories about their Dreamers. So that was one thing that had 80-some percent of support in the American people, but we couldn't get the other side to agree to that. Most unfortunate. Uh, but comprehensive immigration reform, the bigger picture of it all, we had, it was bipartisan in the United States Senate. Bipartisan. It wasn't a bill I loved to death. It wasn't a bill I would have written, but it was a bill that took us forward. And that's what we all have to learn is when do you hold and when do you fold on all these things. And, and it would have taken us forward, but the Republicans in the House would not bring it up in that Congress, so we lost that opportunity. But there, there, we still have to keep working toward that. And there are certain, certain pieces of it that we should be able to do, but so far we haven't gotten some movement on the other side. But it has to be done. I mean, we're the United States of America, a nation of immigrants, unless you were fortunate enough to be born in the Native American community, and we owe them so much. But by and large, a nation of immigrants, and you think, remember? Remember when your family came? Well, and don't take it from me, another Republican president, Ronald Reagan. When you go home or in the car, oh no, you don't have cars here, right? <laughs> I'm a Californian, okay. When you look up Ronald Reagan, this is the last speech I will make as President of the United States. And I want to send a message, communicate a message to a country I love. And he went on to talk about immigration and the Statue of Liberty and the beacon that the Statue of Liberty is to the rest of the world and the constant reinvigoration of newcomers to America. And I'm giving you a shorter version. If America decides to close the door Percy says, we are preeminent in the world because we have constantly infused with these newcomers to our country. If we close the door, we will no longer be preeminent in the world. Ronald Reagan. It's much more, I didn't do justice to it. You have to read the whole speech. It's really beautiful. His last speech as President of the United States. Okay. Um, question, what would you say to the disillusioned younger generation who have sadly lost faith in the government, especially with regards to environmental policy? Yeah, I think that that's a fair question. I do think that the issue that relates to climate is a very important connection to younger people. We have to listen to younger people. We can't surmise or decide what would be interesting to them. But what we hear on the campuses and, and across the country, not even on campuses, but just in the communities. The issue of climate and environment, it's, it's about the future. And again, health, jobs, and security, and, and values. And this is a place that the IRA has really hit home in a big way because it is about that. But the, the piece about environment that we all have to remember in the world, not just in our own country, is environmental justice. Because there have been so many injustices, um, I guess committed is the word, but enacted, that, that, that have, have, uh, have given young people, when I hear from them anyway, pause to say, well, is that real? Will that really happen? For example, the infrastructure bill. Infrastructure bill had a great deal in it about in environment. Not as much as I would have wanted, but it was a bipartisan infrastructure bill. But they said, well, if they build infrastructure, they'll build it through a neighborhood and divide a neighborhood. That's what they always used to do. I said, well, that's not the way it is now. Not under President Biden. He wouldn't sign a bill that divides community. He's united communities. He's being inclusive. He's being just having justice in our environmental and infrastructure, and they are related uh, challenges. So the, the, what I would say to young people who are interested in this issue, just speak up and make your voices heard in whatever party. It doesn't mean you have to vote Democratic, but make sure who you vote for understands where you are on the environment 
and be sure to let them know, let you know where they are on the environment because this is, is as important an issue, a challenge to a whole generation of, of all ages, but nonetheless uh, in, in uh, power now. And uh, we, we see that as a connection that can not only help us prevail in our elections on the Democratic side, but help change the dynamic so that it's not a party issue. It shouldn't be a party issue. It never used to be. The Republicans were good on the environment in days gone by. Now Richard again, Nixon was an environmental hero. Hard to EPA, believe. EPA, uh, yeah. Nixon, I mean, a hero, but I mean, he signed it. All right. He signed it. He signed it, and that was no. good. Uh, I, I, but I, just my, my two cents, I don't think, I, I think a lot of people, younger people in general, just don't understand the magnitude of what was accomplished with the IRA. It, it, this, uh, it's not everything, it's not close to everything, but, but we have made an incredible turn towards climate protection that, that no, one, no one thought was possible. So that is a really big deal. Um, uh, credit to you. Okay, I think this is our last one, and it, it is, uh, as the first woman speaker, do you feel that any aspect of your experience as an American woman particularly helped prepare you to be especially effective in your position as speaker or leader? And, and as I may say, it, it is a remarkable thing that the most effective speaker of the House in American history, <laughs> you and uh, who happened to be a woman, um, can you say anything about to what extent uh, that mattered? Well, th I thank you for that question and comment. But as I said at the start, after Janet's comments, uh, I accept every compliment on behalf of the House Democrats who made all of this possible. Uh, they had the courage to take the, make the votes. And again, in my view, it's all about freedom. The Affordable Care Act was about freedom. It, it gave people more opportunity to do what they wanted, having some uh, confidence in their health care, uh, issues that related to uh, gay marriage, Respect for Marriage Act, really something so wonderful. Who would have thunk it 20 years ago? Well, we were on a path when we were fighting against HIV and AIDS to take it to a place where there was much more respect uh, for the community. But um, uh, some people say to me um, after a meeting or something, do you know how different that meeting would have been if a man were conducting it? Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I never was in the meeting with the, when a man was conducting it. I never. <laughs> I, had to be, I had to be elected speaker to get in the room. I never was in the Democratic Speaker's office until I walked in as speaker. Oh, Isn't my. Amazing? Isn't that an amazing thing? That's an amazing I thing. I was in the Republican Speaker's office as Democratic leader to go to bipartisan meetings, but I was never in that. So it is, uh, it's about... I think, um, I will say this with all the respect in the world for the gentlemen who are here, you too. Well, with, with <laughs> some of us. That it's not about women being better than men, it's about having everybody at the table, whether it's women or <laughs> people of color, diversity, diversity, diversity. Why wouldn't we have the best thinking wherever it's springing from? And it, the, um, uh, it was exciting to be the first one. I actually, quite frankly, Paul, I, I wasn't thinking about being speaker. I was just being a legislator. Right. I was being a legislator. And then when it came to the end, the first time, I was like, oh, I should have enjoyed this thing. Look at this. I have this big <laughs> office and all the rest. But I was just thinking about being a legislator, which is what I l love to do. And, uh, but it was... Um, Wonderful. When I went to Congress, there were 13 women, 12 Democrats, one, 11 Republicans. We now have over 90 Democrats. They have into the 20s or 30s, and they're making progress. But we made a decision that we were going to have more women, more women in the Congress. How could it be out of 435 people? Almost as many people, like this room, 23 women and the rest men. So we made a decision to have that. And I don't think if we ever, if we didn't have more women, we would have ever had a woman speaker. But um, the first meeting that I went to as leader, now I'm leader, I go to this meeting at the White House. I've been there a million times as an appropriator, 
as an intelligence person, 30 years in intelligence, not, then it was less because it was a while ago. So I go into the meeting, and I didn't even think about it, because again, I've been to the White House a million times. And then I went, the door opened, and I went into the meeting. I realized this was a meeting unlike any meeting I had ever been to at the White House. In fact, it was a meeting unlike any meeting any woman had ever been at the White House. It was the president and the leaders, House and Senate, Democrat and Republican, president and vice president. George Bush was president. Um, and it's different than a cabinet meeting because a cabinet meeting, they're all appointed by the president. You know what I'm saying? One vote counts, but they're all appointed by the president. And so that's wonderful, but it's derivative of the guy at the center of the table. This you go in the meeting and you're there in your right as a representative of the Democrats in the House of Representatives, the first branch of government, the legislative branch. <laughs> so we go into the meeting and George Bush, as gracious a person as ever was, forgetting, I mean, not forgetting the war in Iraq, but a, a lovely and gracious <laughs> man, graciously welcoming me. Oh my gosh, this is the first time a woman has ever been at this meeting. I know you're gonna have some things to say, but while I was talking, I was very distracted in this small room with this small, but I, I felt like I was getting crowded on my chair. I, I just, I didn't know what was happening. And then I realized Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott and, and uh, Sojourner Truth and Alex Paul, they were all sitting on the chair with me. And, and I could actually hear them say, at last we have a seat at the table. <laughs> and then they were gone. And my and I'm still not paying attention to the president. My, my first thought was, and we want more. And we want more women, we want more diversity and all the rest at, at that table. So I feel very blessed to have been given the honor of serving as le whip, leader, speaker, but 20 years leader and speaker, that's a long time. Uh, and it was an honor. But I always say the greatest honor was that the people of San Francisco asked me to be elected me to be their voice. On the, so when I go on the floor of the house, even now, even though I don't have the beautiful titles my colleagues have given me before, I'm so proud of our new leadership, Hakeem Jeffries, Catherine Clark, and, and, um, and Pete Aguilar and others. But, but, um, but I still very, feel very proud to speak for the people of San Francisco there. So in any event, um, to the women, know your power. The country needs you. There's nobody like you in the history of the world. Know why you want to do it. Know what you're talking about. Know how to get it done. Show them your authenticity. Be yourself. That was the best advice I ever had. So the women who are aspiring to running or helping somebody run or getting behind an issue, be yourself. Your authenticity is the best connection to young people who know sincerity and sincerity about what they care about. So thank you, Paul, for the, uh, for the, in the instruction. Thank you. This is the, uh, I have nothing to add to that, for that inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you.